Picture 7 The ox forgotten The self remains The Dharma is not dual. The ox just points to our subject. As rabbit and snare differ in name, so fish and net are not the same. As gold comes forth from dross, so the moon emerges from clouds. A shaft of its icy light, ancient even in the age of Ion. Astride your ox. You've reached the hills of home. With ox put away, you too are at ease. The sun's risen three poles high, yet still you're dreaming. Your whip and line hang idle under the thatched eaves. hard to take people who fret over good and bad, knowing nothing of Naniwa Reads. At the sixth stage, you tame the ox completely, made it your own, and then rode that ox back to your original home. This was a way of talking about attaining Satori. It is fine to have attained Satori. Indeed, it is truly wonderful. But clinging to it is a kind of sickness. After long, arduous practice and self-discipline, you finally attained Kensho and now declare that you must save all sentient beings. This is a fine accomplishment, but having completed the practice, you then get trapped by Satori. You start saying things like, I've had Kensho, I'm not your average monk. I must have a bigger cushion and my tea must be served in special utensils. I have completed Zen practice, so that means I can drink. I can do anything I want. In this way, Satori makes people into its servant and strips them of their freedom. 
This is what is meant by the phrase fettered by the Buddha, fettered by the Dharma. That is why, when you have attained Satori, you must forget about Satori. When you become a rich man, you must forget about your money. The Heart Sutra contains a phrase, No wisdom and no attainment. This means that fundamentally, there is no knowing anything and no gaining anything. Intrinsic wisdom begins when there is no longer anything strange or unusual. Where there is no attaining Satori, that is Satori. This is what is meant by forgetting the ox. It means to forget that very ox that you strove so hard to get. The Dharma is not dual, the ox just points to our subject. If you penetrate the way, then the Dharma is just one. The Lotus Sutra says, there is only the Dharma of the one vehicle, not of two or of three. The Vimalakirti Nadesa Sutra speaks of the Dharma gate of non-duality. There is no dualism in the Dharma. There cannot be any dualism between the self that captured the ox and the ox that was captured. If there is any distinction between the self that was awakened to the Dharma and the Dharma to which the self was awakened, that awakening is not genuine. Self and ox are one. Satori can only be that place where self and dharma are one, where person and ox have become one entity. However, the ox pictured here is being used only as a symbol, as a convenient teaching device. And the search for the ox represents the practice and discipline required in seeking the Dharma. We have used the ox just as a provisional way of talking about Buddha nature.
as rabbit and snare differ in name, so fish and net are not the same. In order to catch a rabbit, you set a snare, but the object is to catch a rabbit, not catch a snare. When you have caught the rabbit, you no longer need the snare. The ox is used in the same way. As a means of achieving awakening to Buddha nature, we created a snare called the ox. But once you have understood Buddha nature, you no longer need the ox. Ox is another word for the snare here. In order to awaken to Buddha nature, you went searching for and finally caught the ox. But once awakened to Buddha nature, you no longer need the ox. As gold comes forth from dross, so the moon emerges from clouds. When you have caught the fish, you forget about the trap. As in the refining of gold from ore, once refined, that gold never again can be returned to ore. Once it has been refined into pure gold, even if it should be buried a thousand years, it will always shine. That changeless quality is what makes gold valuable. In the same way, once you have attained Satori, once you have separated out Satori from delusive passion, then that Satori never gets mixed together again with delusive passion. Clouds cover over the moon and then part. The clouds may have obscured the moon but the moon itself was always shining. If only the clouds part, the moon must appear. The moon of our heart-mind is hidden and cannot be seen because of the clouds of unreal thoughts and elusive passions. It is not that there is no moon of Buddha nature. Buddha nature is always there. When you sit quietly in Zazen, the clouds of unreal thoughts and passions lift to reveal your own heart-mind as full and round as the autumn harvest moon. 
You must see it for yourself. When you attain that condition where the clouds part and that splendid full moon floats in the sky, then if you press Mu even further, that Mu will light up the entire universe of the 3,000 worlds. When you enter the meditation room, there is no distinction between male and female. There is no need for formality and reserve. You must bring with you that moon, which, like the full moon, lights all heaven and earth. A shaft of its icy light, ancient even in the age of Ion. The light of that moon is a shaft of icy brilliance, truly awe inspiring. Its chill light causes one to shiver and tremble just as does the cold light of the frosty moon. And it has been shining from before the age of Ion. Legend says that the Buddha named King Ion, King of Imposing Sound, was the most ancient of Buddhas the very first Buddha to appear in our world. Since Iron Buddha was born a billion billion kalpas ago, that light has been shining for more than a billion billion kalpas. The light of Buddha nature shines right through the innumerable culpas of past, present and future. It penetrates all infinite space and endless time. This is a shaft of its icy light, ancient even in the age of Ion. Vertically, it pierces right through the three worlds. Horizontally, it embraces the ten directions. To truly appreciate this, the light of Buddha nature, is the meaning of the ox forgotten, the self remains. In the picture for the ox forgotten, the self remains. The ox does not appear in the picture, and it looks as if the ox has been put away in a stall. Only the self remains, sitting alone. Here, an appropriate verse has been appended. Astride your ox, you've reached the hills of home. 
with ox put away, you too are at ease. Once you have managed to ride home on your ox, there is no longer any need for it. Since there is no need to keep hold of the line, you can let it go. You may let the ox go wherever it wants to go. Let it do whatever it wants to do, whether it be feeding on grass, or lying in the fields. You can forget about the ox altogether. The fact that the ox is entirely gone means that Buddha nature is completely superfluous. There is nothing to seek. There is nothing in the world that you were searching for. All you do is eat when food appears, drink when a drink appears. An old saying goes, when hungry I eat, when tired I take a nap. This is the scene when you reach the last station at the end of the railroad of life. Once a student came to me and asked me, what is the purpose of life? When I replied, to play, he was disappointed. Just to play, is it? He asked and went away. But if you were still thinking that life must have a purpose, then you have not yet arrived at the last station, at the end of the railroad of life. When you arrive at the last station at the end of the line, you play. When you have reached the last station at the end of the line, there is nothing to seek. All one does is play. You two relax. Here, to have things is fine. Not to have them is also fine. To live is fine. To die is also fine. To be happy is fine. To be sad is also fine. If it rains, that's fine. If it shines, that too is also fine. Every day is a good day. Every day is a good day.
the sun's risen three poles high. Yet still you're dreaming. The red sun has risen as high as the top of the three bamboo poles, tied end to end. And still, you are fast asleep. You are home after being away for so long. Now, there's no need to be formal with anyone. No need to always be bowing to people. You just let out a big yawn and lie spread eagled on the floor. Spiritually, we have all been lost and wandering on a great journey since birth. In fact, it is not just since birth. From beginningless eons ago, from before the beginning of the world, we have been spiritual vagrants. And now, we have come home, returned to Buddha. Mama, let me sleep in tomorrow. Let me snore and sleep for three days. Once in your life, you must know what this is like. For so many years, you sought the Buddha way to make it yours. Now, there is nothing left in all the world for you to seek. Your whip and line hang idle under the thatched eaves. You no longer need the whip and line which you use right up to the end. Now unnecessary, you toss them into a corner of the closet or the woodshed. Even precious works and texts, which you thought would be important someday, you find are now boring and, and useless. Cohen's seals of approval, even these have become irrelevant to you. Once you truly understand then such things are unnecessary. The robe and bowl handed down from Shakyamuni are unnecessary. Koans are unnecessary. The whip and line are put away in the woodshed. Ikyu has written a verse. How pleasant to live in the house of emptiness. And with Sumeru for my pillow, to sleep alone.
Return to your original home and the whole world becomes yours. You are master of the world. No need to be formal for any reason. How pointless, people who fret over good and bad, knowing nothing of Naniwa reads. Along the Yodo River near Osaka, there are stretches of Naniwa reeds. These reeds are called ashi by the local people but in other parts of the country, they are called Yoshi. Now there is a pun here. The Japanese word Yoshi can also mean good, and the word Ashi can also mean bad. Fighting over whether something is good or bad, Yoshi or Ashi, is like fighting over the name of the reed, Yoshi or Ashi. No matter what you call it, the reed is the same after all. In the same way, how trivial it is when people fight over whether something is good or bad both sides are lost in the world of discrimination and making judgments about everything. So long as they are blundering about in the world of discrimination, both sides are bad, both sides are ashy. The fact that they do not realize this is a matter of 10,000 regrets. To penetrate right through judgments about good or bad, isn't that your original face? Isn't that Buddha nature? When the clouds of good and bad have been swept completely away, then isn't that the moon of reality shining there? Most people think that the clouds represent the bad and the moon represents the good. But that is not so. Good exists only in relation to bad. It changes depending on the situation at the time, with one's attitude at the time with the person involved. It is nothing fixed. When I'm right, he's wrong. When he's right, I'm wrong. And both of us are just fools.
to think that the clouds represent bad and the moon represents good is a great mistake. The clouds represent both good and bad. When the clouds of both good and bad have been swept away, then a brilliance appears as eternal and unchanging as the gold which has been refined from ore. 